All right. Thanks everyone for coming to our um, fourth installment of the Solve Summer Academy. Uh, I am one of your community managers, Jane Zanzig. Frank. She's muted again. Kareem's the other one. <laughs> but she's here. Just trust us. Okay. Uh, my name's Kareem and I'm the other community manager. All right. Okay, so today we're talking about building the solution. So this is where we're at in the summer. Um, we've talked about the intro, um, scoping data science for good projects, uh, how you can explore and understand the data once you get your hands on it. And then this time we're talking about actually building something, what is your approach, um, how do you make sure that you make the right thing. Um, and then the two remaining uh, sessions will be bias, fairness, and ethics in two weeks, um, and then implementation and handoff on the 27th. And then at the end of the summer, some point after the 27th, we'll have our data fest where we get to hear some of the results of the projects from summer. Um, but that date is still being confirmed, but we'll let you know as soon as that's uh, solid. So what are we doing today? Um, today we're going to get the latest scoop on some of the Solve for Good projects. Um, we'll hear from the Dal City of Dallas and Child Poverty Action Lab team, uh, who will show how they're mapping historic evictions to target outreach efforts to encourage residents to seek eviction mitigation funding. Um, and we'll hear from the AMFAN project, which is a new project using NLP to better understand and respond to the unmet needs of people who are affected by um, cyclones and extreme weather events. And that's in partnership with the International Water Management Institute. Uh, then the Solve Summer Academy team will share a little bit of background on why we think building the solution is important enough to hold a whole session about. Um, and then we'll have a few friends of the program uh, drop some knowledge. We have Ben Brew here to talk about his experiences um, starting a data consultancy and working with clients to find the right technical approach to meet their needs. Uh, and then we'll hear from Tristan, uh, who will give us a little bit of a primer on triage, which is a tool that was developed at the Center for Data Science and Public Policy to help build and manage predictive modeling pipelines. So, without further ado, I can kick it over to Andrew um, for the Solve Project Drumbeat. Okay, so um, as Jane said, welcome everybody to the, the fourth installment of the Solve Summer Academy. Um, kind of amazing that we're already, already four webinars in. Um, and so I'll be giving you today's community announcements. Um, so per usual, we have some new resources at uh, the solveforgood.org slash resources page. Um, we've been trying to be very prudent about uh, uh, adding new resources to the, to the, um, the website. And this includes um, some updated instructions for number one, how to sign up as a volunteer on the Solve for Good website. So if you haven't done that yet and you would like a little bit of guidance on how, you can go to the resources page and download the, the new instructions for doing so. Um, and then importantly, we also have updated the instructions for organizations to sign up um, and how to post a project. So you can see new and improved guidance on how to go through that process. Um, we now have all of the recordings from the previous three um, Solve Summer Academy installments up on the Data Science for Social Good YouTube account. Um, so we'll send out a link to that in the chat on Zoom and also over the Slack channel. So if you haven't yet, check those out or subscribe to the Data Science for Social Good YouTube channel. Um, that's where we'll be posting the recordings from this installment and, and future installments. Um, so also tomorrow, or also uh, please make sure if, you, uh, if you're enjoying these, uh, please share the information about the Solve Summer Academy through your networks. Um, so our next one will be on Thursday, August 13th at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And um, this is going to be a, a super cool webinar that we'll be hosting, which is on addressing bias and fairness in predictive models, um, which I think is a, is a super relevant topic uh, for, for the types of things that Solve for Good is aiming to do. Um, and you're hearing from, from a, a team that's, that's very experienced in this. 
Um, so we put a lot of effort into putting these together and we want as many people as possible to attend. So if you don't mind sharing it through your networks, um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, again, the Solve for Good platform is open for all social good organizations to post their projects. Um, you can just go to the homepage and there's a big button, big orange button that says post a project. So if you are from a social good organization or you know a social good organization, um, don't hesitate to just go ahead and go through that process. Um, and as soon as you post that project, someone from the Solve for Good team, a project scoper, or, or could be myself or someone else on, that you'll see speaking today, will get in touch with you to talk a little bit more about your project. Um, so we have, you know, we, we reported on this a little bit last, last webinar, but we have over a thousand members in our Solve for Good Slack channel. And then we have over a thousand volunteers that have signed up on Solve for Good over the life cycle of it. Um, so we have so many volunteers and, and super talented people and we're looking always for more projects. Um, so if you have something that you, you need help with and there's an opportunity to make, make an impact for your beneficiaries, um, don't hesitate to post the project on Solve for Good. Um, to this end, uh, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern, um, we'll be hosting what's called the Project Scoper Training. And this will be the first of, the, of, of many Project Scoper trainings. We hope to be uh, holding these perhaps about bi-weekly. Um, but the idea here is that if you're interested in being a Project Scoping volunteer, so if you're interested in on, being on the volunteer side about speaking with organizations on how to, to scope projects, and specifically what this training goes through is a day in the life of a solve for good Project Scoper. So when you're a volunteer, what can you actually expect? How do you connect with an organization through the Solve for Good platform? Um, how do you go through the scoping process, which we have tons of tons of resources on this, um, but then also some other aspects about it, like about staffing and, and putting together different teams for the Solve for Good projects. Um, so if you're interested in, in being a project scoping volunteer, um, it's important to, to join us tomorrow um, for this session. And tickets are limited to 50 seats, and we'll send out the, the Eventbrite if you're interested in doing that. They're limited to 50 seats. Um, so if you don't get it this week, we'll have more in the future. So, so uh, don't feel like you're missing out, but also if you're interested, sign up quickly because the, the seats might go. Um, and to this end, so if you've been recently to the Solve for Good website, you know there's kind of a little, uh, there's an improvement on the homepage um, that kind of gives you a little bit of the state of play, the kinds of things that I've, I've been talking about in these Solve Summer Academies about Solve for Good. Um, so importantly, you can register for all the upcoming Solve Summer Academies. Um, but then it also kind of gives some information on what's happening on the website right now. So just this month, we've already had over 260 new volunteers sign up. Um, and as you can see right now, this is just taken, this screenshot was taken just earlier today. There's four projects that are waiting to be scoped. Um, so that should be a little bit of motivation, uh, motivates a little bit the, the project scoping training that we're hoping to do tomorrow um, so that we can have volunteers that are, are ready and able to help scope these projects and, and create some positive impacts for these organizations beneficiaries. Um, and that's kind of everything from the community announcement side. Um, now today we have two awesome updates from different project teams. Um, so as Jane said, we're gonna hear from the Dallas housing team and the, the AMFAN, Cyclone AMFAN team. Um, so without further ado, I will pass this off now to Tang Yi, who's gonna present on their, give a little update about what's happening on the mitigating emission risks for residents in the city of Dallas project. Just if I can jump in really quickly um, before mm -hmm. you start. Uh, would love to hear in the chat from all attendees, um, say hello, say where you're joining from, and then we'll have Q&A with both of these project partners um, after they share, so you can start throwing out any questions you have in the chat right now. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tong. Uh, for this project, we are trying to uh, collaborate with the CPOL and State of Dallas to help them um, reduce the eviction rates for residents in the city of Dallas. And um, here are uh, the other girls who are uh, working on this project. So, so for this project, what we're trying to do is to, um, to help with the eviction. Um, for a lot of cases in Dallas, uh, when, for example, landlords want to increase the rent, they will try to kick, off, uh, kick out the tenants on false ground this is where the eviction uh, that we don't want to see. So for this project, our goal is to minimize the number of people who are evicted from their homes and to maximize the number of people that we can assist, um, for example, by some funds or by 
connecting them to other safety services. So how to do this? We got the data of the eviction records in the past. So the first step we want to do is to, to know where the eviction are taking places in the final granularity. And the second step is to understand what are the factors that are related to these evictions so that maybe in the future we can predict uh, where um, is having a higher risk to have this eviction. Um, so far, we have explored the data and uh, cleaned the data. Uh, and we also have um, geocode the addresses so that we can um, understand where the cases are happening. So to directly jump in what we have already got, <laughs> let's look at um, some visualizations. So for, for now, uh, we visualize all the records on maps so that it gives us a very um, general idea about where the evictions are happening. For this map, we combine data from 2017 to 2019 and visualize all the evictions on the map. But after we see the map, we are asking, we, we look at it and what information we can get, what information we want to deliver to, to the audience of this map. We, we feel like, okay, so maybe the first, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, okay, what is the raw number of the cases in each area? And the second question may be, although the raw number could be different, um, the, uh, the population in different areas could also be different. So maybe the density is important. And another question is, what's the change over time? Um, till now, we have tried to answer these questions. For example, we also um, map the eviction records by, by years so that we want to see what's the change over time. Um, are there like um, evictions spread differently over years? Uh, if some area has an increased rate of eviction, um, from the uh, the right, lab, uh, right map, we can see that the pattern is a little different. For example, in the uh, in the right top part, um, the the uh, the green part the, the green dot represent the records in 2019, the uh, the red one represent 2018, and the yellow one represent 2017. We can see from the red red top part that uh, in 2019, the records seems to be a little less than the previous years. But we also need like um, more detailed and more sophisticated analysis to, to, de uh, to demonstrate where exactly the case are changing. We also separately map out. We try to uh, explore different um, possibilities to map out these eviction records. And we, when we separately map, map out, uh, we can see that um, it actually seems very similar. The, the basic one, the basic pattern is very similar. It just at different locations. Um, sometimes the, uh, the pattern is a little bit different. For example, uh, if you look at here on the bottom, the pattern seems to be different over years. Um, this is what we have just got. Um, next, we are trying to explore what exactly we can convey um, from these maps. As I just mentioned, for example, we can convey the increased rate of different um, areas. We can also uh, map out the density of different areas. Um, we also want to uh, connect these records with other um, predictors or uh, we want to explore some correlations from factors to the eviction records. For example, uh, one out idea is to map out um, the, um, the school mobility. So we can separate the school mobility in different areas into high and low. And then um, on different areas uh, of high and low, we give the area of different colors. And then we uh, map out the eviction records. From that, we can have a basic idea about whether the school mobility can have some correlation with the uh, evasion records. So um, that's what we have just got. Um, if you have any questions or any suggestions, we are happy to discuss. And we have one question from the audience. They're asking, um, what software did you use to build uh, these maps? 
oh, we use QGIS. So it's a geo database. Cool. You can also use ArcGIS. Did you find that the scope has evolved since you started working on this project? Um, for this project, it might be a little bit different from the general ones because this project already been um, probably, I think um, almost part is already project scope. So we didn't change too much on this one. Cool. One more question for you. Uh, have you found anything interesting or surprising while you've done your initial data exploration? Uh, yes. So uh, one thing that is surprising <laughs> is about the data format. <laughs> but, uh, this always happens in different, um, in different projects. But in this particular project, this is the first time that I have seen a very unusual time timestamp um, format. So at the very beginning, we were thinking, oh, what, what this is? This is a five digit timestamp. <laughs> and then we clarify with our partner and we see, okay, they actually have some, um, have, have some reasoning under behind this format. The, the first digit is the year. And then uh, the second and the third digits are months and then the dates. So this is one thing. We also find some other thing that is, that it, that is interesting. Um, so for example, they gave us different sources of the eviction records and so that we can compare and validate which one um, is more reliable. We have another question for you from Hannah Gorman who wants to know if COVID-19 will change eviction patterns a lot and how does that affect uh, the scope? That's a very good question and that's the question we also want to answer from this project. <laughs> so uh, to do this we, uh, we asked the partner to collect data um, of before and after the COVID-19 so that we can compare. Yeah, but this is still in process. Okay, and the data, is it, uh, Momin wants to know if it's spatial point data or is it by address? How is it structured? Um, it gave us the address data. Okay. So cool. um, this is also like public available, um, but for us, we need to change the address to map the address to uh, longitude and latitude so that we can map the data and use the data. Okay, awesome. One thing to sort of, one question was, this is preempting kind of next, next session two weeks from now is your project goals were you know around efficiency uh and effectiveness you know maximize number of people what about fairness or equity do you do you care if only all uh, uh people in the same neighborhood get help and everybody gets ignored or racial gender fam, you know income status things like that do you care about that yeah that's a good question uh, yeah we do care about that that's why uh we want to uh, collect the ACS data so that we can understand uh, to what level the eviction is connected to the demographic data. Got it. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more about the, how the project turns out. Um, and then we can yeah. turn it over to Project Amphan. I think we have Ansel and Michelle here. So uh, um, my name is Ansel Creighton. Um, I was a 2018 ESSG fellow in Chicago, also like Tom. Um, and yeah, I am the project manager for Team Anthem. So our team consists of uh, obviously myself as project manager, but four other data scientists, um, Jared Ross, Joao Fonseca, Kanaf Mera, and Marcelo Sandoval Castaneda. Um, and our goal is to collaborate with the International Water Management Institute which we refer to as Emmy, to identify and better understand the experience and needs um, of vulnerable societies affected by natural disasters using social media data. Um, more concretely, um, we would like to understand the impact of natural disasters, um, understand the impact of natural disasters through the voices of those impacted, um, and not necessarily funnel through um, sort of experts. Um, and our main goal here is to produce um, an analysis using social media data, um, using NLP, potentially other um, ML tools that allow us to sort of meet this goal. Um, and then once we sort of have this analysis produced, um, we would sort of collaborate with them to disseminate um, through different mediums, whether um, one is thinking about a web tool that would be useful for um, policymakers, aid organizations, for governments, um, and research institutes, um, as well as research papers. Um, so we're focusing our um, main 
um, use case here is going to be on Cyclone Amphen. Um, this was a major storm that was developed over the Bay of Bengal. Um, it made landfall on May 20th, 2020, um, and it impacted um, many different countries. It was India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. Um, it's been noted as the most damaging storm um, in the history of the Indian Ocean, um, causing billions of dollars in damage, many deaths. Um, it was ravaging agricultural lands um, and also um, displacing many people from their homes and forcing them into sort of crowded shelters. Um, and you could think about all of this happening um, while each of the respective governments are trying to manage their response to COVID-19. So an event like this is exactly what our analysis is meant to target. Um, some of the um, things that we've been doing thus far, um, so we're just ending our second week. So a major part obviously has been data. Um, our main source of data is going to be the Twitter API um, using a premium API. Um, obviously things happen. <laughs> you have to learn to expect the unexpected in these projects. Um, so we've had, had a few issues, which we'll go into detail um, about later. Um, done some initial EDA, um, and we've been sort of brainstorming how to process these tweets. So um, our queries are in four different languages. Um, so we have English, Hindi, Bengali, and Odia. So we have to think about how to manage that, um, as well as there being some um, additional languages in our um, data set, um, and then also just cleaning the text itself. Um, another huge part of um, what we've been doing has been sort of refining our scope. So we've had sort of many discussions with the partner team and other Andy researchers um, to work to narrow down our research questions um, and basically help them understand what is possible with data science and also sort of help us understand where data science will be useful um, for the problems that they would like to address. So um, one example is actually today, we just got off our partner call with, kind of like right before this um, and our team gave um, an an NLP overview to um, the partner side. And um, we covered many different techniques. And for each technique, we had around like, two examples of how we can apply it to this project. Um, so I think that's able to help them understand um, many different use cases, but also uh, kind of sort of get their ideas flowing about maybe how they can use it um, and get back to us with feedback there. Um, another thing is data. Um, there has been a transition in our scope around data as well. So originally the project started more as how is social media useful or um, how, is, how can we use social media to understand um, these needs. Um, but now we're sort of transitioning and trying to ask the question, is, is social media um, useful? Um, and if so, to what extent? Um, so we're now starting to consider other data sources as well, like flood data, news outlets. Um, other things. And then finally, um, I think it's related to point two would be the personal experience. So we have the benefit of having a team member who is also um, based in Kolkata, in India, where um, an experience can firsthand, um, as well as we have um, some contacts on the partner side that have also experienced it. But I think this has also shaped our scope, um, made us consider a few different things like um, there being internet outages, um, days following the cyclone. So maybe the spike in tweets is not exactly from the vulnerable society that we're looking to identify. So we need to think a little bit more carefully, um, carefully about um, what our sample, or who our sample represents and exactly what information we're extracting from it. And then there's also, of course, um, a political element um, behind news about Anthem as well. Um, so I think now um, I'll pass it to Michelle, who's um, at the Digital Innovations Annals at Emmy, and she'll be able to explain more about the background. Sure. Thanks, Ansel. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Ng. As Ansel said, I'm a Digital Innovations Analyst at the International Water Management Institute. Um, I'm based in Sri Lanka. Uh, so IMI is a research for development institute working to promote a water secure world. Um, so we have over 100 researchers who specialize in hydrology, in economics, agriculture, governance, gender, um, and a lot more in 13 offices across Africa and Asia. Uh, and I think a few different things brought us to Solve for Good um, in this particular project on Cyclone Fan. 
Uh, overall, as Jane mentioned earlier, we want to better match people's needs following extreme weather events with context specific responses. Um, and we became curious about how online data such as data, uh, sorry, such as Twitter posts um, and news headlines, especially local and regional news headlines, um, can serve as an input in decision making processes, whether by donors, whether by governments, humanitarian aid NGOs, etc. Um, we also know that many people think of extreme weather events in terms of biophysical um, concepts like wind and rain, um, despite the fact that extreme weather events happen to people and have really huge, profound social, political, and economic dimensions to them as well. Um, so we're hoping that this online data can help to characterize the more human experiences of Cyclone and fun as well. Um, yeah, and we're hoping to test this methodology um, on one of the most extreme, extreme weather events of 2020 so far. Um, as Ansel mentioned again, we're especially curious about how well this data actually represents affected people. Um, and so we're interested in kind of the inclusivity aspect of online data. Um, and maybe further down the line, we're hoping we can compare our analysis of the online data with ground truthing data whether through like government's needs assessments or NGOs data, or um, maybe we could apply for funding and try to do some field work ourselves. So I think that sums it up from my side. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with Sol for Good and Ansel and the other data scientists. Thanks. Thanks, Ansel and Michelle. Um, would love to hear a little bit more, uh, Ansel, you mentioned about um, pulling Twitter data in four different languages. Um, have you come across any uh, specific challenges with um, integrating all of that together? Yeah, so um, one issue is that sort of right after Amphen, um, there were um, a few other cyclones that happened. So we did notice that there was contamination in our data. So it did sort of help us. We needed to refine a lot of our queries. Um, um, so that was one sort of issue that we had there. Um, and we sort of narrowed it down to there just being, one, English language was quite noisy in general. So we needed to have more strict rules um, on English and also in Hindi because um, the sort of following cyclones were more in India, um, so we did notice a little bit more noise there. Um, so that was one issue. Another was obviously technical, um, our API. <laughs> we, um, yeah, so our understanding was that we would have access to um, uh, a million, uh, 1.25 million um, tweets a month, but um, turns out the at the base level of our API, it's really only like 50,000. Um, you can only make 100 requests per month and each one you can get 500 tweets. So that was a big difference. And now we're sort of like trying to manage that and um, think about ways around that as well. Um, but yeah, so that would be sort of our issues that we ran into with data. I know it's really common that, um, you know, what data you think you'll have uh, from the beginning is often not what you end up with. So it's <laughs> You really never trust it until you actually have it on your machine. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience or from the other uh, panelists? There's a question from Jinya, which I think, well, it's a comment on a question, but it's interesting. So uh, their question slash comment is, in a country where the government may have tight control over what people can post online or there may be some censorship, how does the media data match reality? Is that something that, that you guys are considering? We haven't really addressed this problem yet. Um, so we could actually think about this a little bit more. Is there is there an issue? Are there things we're not seeing because of that? Um, but we have sort of generally come to the conclusion that we don't think that social media data is going to give us the full picture. We're likely missing some aspect of, of um, the problem there. So that's what we're working toward now is trying to look at more data sources, um, things like that. But yeah, um, that's actually a good point. We should probably discuss that. And then with that, I think we move on to our next segment because I don't think we have any further questions. But if you guys have, keep adding them to the chat. Um, and Raid also posted that if you have ideas or suggestions for these projects, maybe uh, types of analyses that they can do, you can go to the project 
discussion page and add them so they'll persist after the webinar and also other people who may not be on the webinar today can participate once they see the webinar online or participate in Slack. And I just wanted to make uh, one comment um, as well about this project. So um, the, after this project was posted, so the, it became open for volunteers and um, uh, they were able to find volunteers that fit well for this project, um, such as Kanav, who's actually from this area, as Ansel mentioned during the project, who's actually was from the region affected by Cyclone Amphan. Um, so all of this is to say, keep your eye on the Solve for Good website and look for projects that are accepting volunteers um, because processes are now in place where you can apply to these projects um, and, and become a, a volunteer on them. All right, thanks both project teams. Great to hear about the excellent work that you're doing. Um, we can move along to our next segment, as Reem said. Uh, we want to just give a quick um, motivation behind why we thought it was so important to talk about building the solution. Um, ostensibly, everyone that's here today is interested in using data for good, right? Um, so we, that means we want to have some kind of positive impact. So we have a pretty strong opinion that that means that you need to make something that's useful and usable. Um, and you do that in partnership with people who are doing the work on the ground. So one thing that working with Raid over the years has drilled into my head is that the kind of hackathon approach can be problematic, right? Um, when there are just data people doing data stuff uh, by themselves, um, a lot of times that just ends up with you make something that you think might be interesting or you make another map or something um, that, but you don't know how anyone would use it, right? Um, so we, yeah, I think the, the biggest thing that we, that we are trying to motivate here is that uh, people should be working with project partners and keeping them closely involved throughout the process. All right, so our next speaker is Ben Brew. Uh, ben, I don't have many good things to say about Ben. <laughs> Joe Brew was busy, so we took... Um, he was, he's pretty busy. He's a pretty busy man. So we he took the younger, the <laughs> less accomplished brother. <laughs> um, so Ben actually was a DSSG fellow in 2015 and uh, him and Jane worked together on projects with the EPA or yes or I think it was the, the EPA. EPA. Yeah yeah it was one of the one of the EPAs but uh, since then Ben has actually struck out on his own and taken all the all these great ideas that he got from DSSG and started the data consulting firm to rake it in so uh <laughs> <laughs> he's going to give us some perspectives of projects he's done working with uh, social good type organizations um, and uh, some of the, maybe not exactly the full technical solutions, but I think he'll give a go good overview about building data solutions that are appropriate to the needs of the project partner rather than going in and deep learning the heck out of everything. So uh, Ben, take it away. All right, let me see. Some technology is you guys see it? Yeah. Yeah. Look yeah. at how great Joe looks. Wow. Look, look how great my wife looks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Just to be clear, Joe is not your wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> they play the same role. Um, so, yes, I am here to talk about uh, the, uh, the working with a client and curating the tool or whatever you build for them to their needs and their expertise and their um, uh, expectation. And as uh, Harim said, I, I was part of DSSG in 2015. My brother did it in 2014. Um, that's me, I'm Ben, that's my brother Joe, that's my wife, Thing. And we all decided afterwards based on you know, Joe and I's experience at DSSG uh, that we wanted to you know, kind of create our own micro little DSSG just with a lot less resources and a lot less talent. but still the will to, to try to find these projects and quickly discovered that uh, there's a really high demand for them. We've been doing this for about two and a half years and really haven't put that much effort into finding clients. And they usually, because we also do other part-time jobs, but they, they tend to just you know fall in our lap. And yeah, they're not the most exciting, sexiest machine learning models, but if you like coding, they're fun and they're useful and they, um, yeah, I mean, there's just a big demand for them. So. Let's see, yeah, so I like to think of data brew and the work we do is like blue collar data science, like working class data science. We don't do 
any of the, the fancy services. I saw some study recently, or it was just a chart of breaking down different positions and how they spend their time on data science. And you, know, you have like the typical research scientist um, spending a lot of time on modeling and, and statistics. Uh, but what the data brewer does, and we don't call ourselves data brewers, but maybe we should, I kind of like that, uh, is that we basically spend most of our time on just cleaning data, organizing it, and then visualizing it either in a dashboard or in a, a, a report. And then other, like uh, there's a lot of communicating with the client and trying to figure out, you know, different, even sometimes they have a set of deliverables they want, but then we can kind of give them insight that they want different deliverables or, or additional deliverables. So it all depends on the client. And then you also have like the Hareems of the world that just spend 100% of their time on other defined by her. So like that chart, I made that myself. Um, so yeah, our typical client. Did you used to do that, Ben? No, just yeah, Ben, it's amazing you, what you can do in paint I know. now. Yeah, it took surprisingly long to create that data frame. I'll, I'll share the code. Uh, so the typical client we have, similar to DSSG in some ways, is short to medium term contracts of like government institutions or academic institutions, um, where they might, may or may not have a data science person in house, but that person is usually highest demand person in that company, so they don't have time to do take on little individual projects for different departments. But we do when we keep that person in mind when we hand off our deliverables because that person that will likely take over the code and the the, the, the GitHub repository and work through the readme. So they have these limited resources and there's just a lot of variance in what they expect and what expertise there is. So some people come to us with a very detailed uh, guide for what they want with no divergence from that. Other people say, we want to do this. Can you help us figure out what we want? And depending on those things, that's part of a lot of the process is just trying to figure out what, what type of client it is. And then based on that, we curate some sort of plan to, for the deliverable. So yeah, I mean, the typical process deciding what they want is we, we is it, are we doing consulting, just telling them, oh, we think, you know, this isn't a big enough sample size or this, this graph that you already have isn't very good and we would visualize it like this, or are we actually offering them some sort of product that we deliver to them and they take over and maintain um, and even maybe in some cases keep us on retainer and, and work on those as they update the data. Um, and are we joining an existing project? A lot of the projects are projects they've already done in Excel or Tableau, and now they want to translate them to Python or Shiny. Um, are they, or are we managing a new one? Um, and yeah, like I said, is it deliverable, fixed and detailed, or is, are we helping them decide? So I just wanted to go through some really quick examples of some of the projects we've done um, recently uh, that, that kind of encompass the, uh, the, the different types of projects we do. So no, this is quite the chart, or quite the, quite the slide. <laughs> Uh, so one thing we're doing is with the World Bank is one of our main clients and because it, within the World Bank, you know, the International Finance Corporation, they're associated with the World Health Organization, but there's tons of sub departments that they're kind of acting alone, they're kind of connected and they have these, this, a lot of funding and these projects that are just sitting there and they, and in these cases, they're not asking us really to consult, but to rather, um, not to consult, but rather to uh, take what they have and, and make them essentially. Um, to, to, yeah, so what they had was a bunch of spreadsheets. Um, this was the, uh, the health and equity finance uh, insurance program at the World Bank. They had a bunch of spreadsheets, uh, macroeconomic data, and they had at one point put it in Tableau and they shared it with us and the spreadsheets. And I don't know much about Tableau, I haven't used it that much. I know it's not open source, but the way they implemented it, it was really clunky and it broke the visual. And, and plus there was limited uh, ways they could edit the charts and, and they, with less detail they could uh, apply to it. So we came in and we scrapped the Tableau and we used our shiny and not only uh, everybody knows my obsession with our shiny, but it's even gotten better. So our shiny now it's not that there's these package package called Golem where we can create a dashboard and make an actual R package out of it. And so when we give it to them, it's every the namespace, everything is all in there. The, the, there's functions we've written for them. So even if they, if they have a basic programmer, they can open up R with directions, apply functions, and run the app. And then they can hopefully edit it and do it later on. So that's one of the uh, examples of giving a, a, an actual product. So they can actually install a R package called from our GitHub repository for them with their own plot theme and everything. So another example similar to this of taking over, or this is taking over a project that, that's finished, but they just got to a dead end. And this isn't visualization, but this is just the 
and this is a very typical that we do, just really messy data. This was the University of Maryland Medical School that had, they collected data with the World Health Organization, with DHS, and the, on uh, verbal autopsy data, and it was in different languages, different formats, and they just needed us to come in, look at all the data, and create some sort of uh, program, which we called Babel, that would take a data set, and you could also give an input of what type of format you wanted in, and what language you wanted in. So then they could eventually gather all this data into something intelligible and do their analysis and publish their papers on verbal autopsy data. So that's what, and that was really simple. It was just, we, we built a package, gave it to them, and now they can run and build functions so they can look at their plots and write papers. Um, and then finally, one that is more, uh, has to do with, I mean, there's definitely a social good aspect to this one, and also um, less consulting, and pro this is more project managing. So sometimes you get a client that really does, like they know they want to do data, they know they have funding for data or surveys or whatever, but they just don't know what to do with it. And seeing my wife used to work at the YWCA and uh, she quit a year, about a couple of years ago, but they reached out to her because she knew, they knew that she has this business. So we want to do a survey in Toronto, Ontario on uh, gun violence in certain neighborhoods. And they sent the list of questions and then they sent follow-up questions about like what other questions we think we asked. Like how many samples do we need to like show some sort of significance? And so, I mean, it wasn't the, it wasn't like the most uh, technical, uh, consulting, but it, we came in and we helped them curate questions and ideas and, and different ways of visual, visualizing the data. And then they, what they wanted was just a long list of plots. And we knew that this is one of those situations where we know better and what they probably really want is like a way to visualize the data without scrolling through 500 page PDF. So we could build them an app and they could, they could look at the data and then create whatever newsletter or research they want out of that. So these are just like three quick examples of the type of stuff um, we, we've been doing. Um, and, and yeah, I just want to emphasize again, it's, it's a lot of, it's not, uh, rarely have we done statistical modeling. It's a lot of data visualization and cleaning, but there's just so much demand for it out there. And the organizations that need it the most are like, uh, that, that want it the most are the ones that need it the most and don't have the, um, necessarily the resources to do it on their own. So it's been, yeah, it, it, been a good experience and uh, I'm open to any questions you guys might have. Like I said, it's all over the place, so there's no one model for this type of work, but I can at least try. So that's Thanks, it. Ben. I think one question that, that people are probably curious about is you mentioned about um, building the the solution that you know the partner needs or in some cases where you decide that what they're asking for is not what they need so in that how do you include the user the end user in your design process how are you getting their feedback or input to make sure that what you build will be useful and also stable yeah so i mean it, it, there's not like a really fancy answer to that um we had one situation where um the client it was york university wanted a dashboard or visualization some sort of website visualization of a bunch of survey data um, and we thought like, oh, they, they probably just want like a dashboard. So we, so we said like, oh, like, this will be really good. But at that point, not taking into account that like some of the inputs to the dashboard were grouped by this variable and get the mean of this. And to some, a lot of people, they don't really know what that means. So we, we went, so we immediately went back with that dashboard and through a couple of meetings quickly found out like they don't actually want a dashboard. They want one of like those websites where there's just like a big header, like 33% of children in Ontario go without you know, the right amount of calcium in their diet or something, and then a big pop-up that shows a map, and then like nothing, like they don't want to actually look at every detail of the summary statistics, they want some sort of, so it's back and forth, back and forth with that, and then like sending them the existing details from us or from other people is like, do you want a more technical dashboard or do you want just something that is catchy and, and, and visualizes the data in a fun way? So then kind of to tack on to that, what's the range in technical skill that your users have? I know you've done like our trainings and things for some of your users, but uh, what do you, what, what's the range of technical skill that you've worked with? Yeah, so, uh, so for the typical project of the World Bank, they always have somebody that is a data scientist, like, or at least a PhD in some sort of quantitative thing. So they know the language yeah. and they have some code written and usually they get somebody to start some dashboard and then send it to us. So with them, you know, that's when we think, okay, we build a package, we have a really good repository so their programmer can pick it up. Uh, but a lot of times it's just, that's the, the, the most important part is finding, like trying to identify exactly what their skill level is. And most people, like they don't, I mean, that 
they're not interested in maintaining a GitHub repository. Yeah. And they do, and a lot of times those people also don't want to, like their, their product is just a, a, an end product. Um, and if they need us in the future, they can rehire us or keep us on retainer. But yeah, I mean, it's just identifying that they're not capable of maintaining the code. And then, you know, then it, yeah, it gets a little bit more difficult getting their feedback on what they want, but we just try, then it's just a more of a back and forth process trying to figure it out. Right. And, and then kind of just to add on to that, how do you get clients like the World Bank to come yeah, to so your little I mean, mom and pop shop? Right. And when we started just like, there was like a few R job, like the R jobs website, we'd scrape every day and send an email to ourselves that there was a new one. And like with the World Bank, we just got our foot in with one project a few years ago. And, and this is usually how it happens when at, like we get our foot in and we do, you know, uh, a couple weeks of work almost for free just to impress them. Uh, and then once we did that, like once we got a foot in and just do one good project, then they pass you around internally. But I mean, yeah, we, and that's kind of the point I was making. There's not, we don't put that much effort in the clients. Um, it's just like we found, and once we got past that critical threshold of, of enough clients, like people started contacting us. And like, and even just locally, just like at the university, look at what people, PhDs or, or institutes are looking for, look at their short-term contracts, especially now with COVID, everybody works remotely. And there's so many short-term jobs for that. You can take it on as an individual or a group. They can, so yeah, just like that, basically. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and Raid said, you know, that if this goes well, he'll tell you which of you is his favorite brew brother. Oh, so, <laughs> I don't know if you'll find out today or in a confidential email after this call. All right, I'm looking forward to it. And I wanted to say, uh, kind of just to echo, this is more of a comment than a question, um, but echo something that, that Ben said about uh, the needs of a lot of organizations being data visualization and dashboarding, and especially with uh, organizations, social good organizations that don't have a lot of technical skills or devote a lot of energy there because they're more focused on, on grassroots change. Um, that's, that is a huge part of their ask and kind of as we've been going through the scoping process for Solve for Good, this comes up a lot, that, that the request is more about data visualization, data analysis, or dashboarding. Um, and so if you have those kinds of skills um, as a volunteer and you're interested in, in looking at projects, and any number of projects right now um, that, that are open for volunteers, um, I'll post one into the chat right now, which is... Um, uh, with an organization working on a vulnerability index, and this is kind of one of the needs that they have as well. Um, so just just to kind of emphasize that, what you said a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, I, I have to say this because, I, I, you know, anytime dashboards are useless, visualizations are useless, right? As an end goal, uh, no organization ever needs a dashboard or a visualization. The organization needs to do something, and they are asking for the dashboard as a way to do that thing. So if somebody's asking you to build a dashboard, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say don't build it, but before you build it, ask them what they want to do with it. Um, mock it up, do it on a whiteboard, do it on a piece of paper, sketch it out um, and say, here's a dashboard you want. Now, what are you going to do with it? Um, and that will help you figure out what to actually build uh, and how to make that dashboard actionable. Um, and even putting in on the dashboard actions, what are the actions you're going to do so that they don't, because often a dashboard is a way to satisfy your boss who's asking for a report. Um, and, and that's useful because it saves you time and headache and just sending, but that's not, you know, that, that doesn't have impact on, on anyone. So, so before you build a dashboard, figure out what the organization wants to do with the dashboard eventually, and then bring it back to, okay, now we can build this. And it may be a list of things. It may be in a spreadsheet that's a dashboard that's just giving you a list of things to act on. It may be alerts that you're getting. Um, so again, to Ben's and, and, and Andrew's point of, of organizations that are coming to you have a need, but they may not know how to ask for what to do to fill that need. They might ask you, we need a dashboard. And what they don't understand is they actually need a way to figure out how to take this data and make it actionable. And they, they need a system in the middle that helps them do that. So, so make sure you have that conversation before, before you start building. Or as we move on to the next section, talking about triage, um, right? Do you mind motivating uh, and giving a bit of background about where triage came from and, and what it, how you envisioned it? Um, sure. Yeah. So, so we're going to um, um, have Tristan, who's been working on building, helping build triage for the last couple of years, um, give, give details, but Basically, triage is our 
um, you want to call it machine learning data science pipeline tool, right? Well, what the, the reason we built triage and we're going to go more, more, more into that um, was we realized that at DSSG and at, at working with different projects with, with different organizations, we were repeatedly kind of tackling similar types of problems. Um, we would work with a school district to help them figure out uh, which students might not graduate on time. And so that's an early warning system. We would then work with the health department to build an early warning system to help them figure out who might not stay with them, uh, uh, come back to them, uh, who needs, who has an HIV uh, patient and needs to, to, to get their prescriptions. Then we work with police departments to help them build an early warning system to figure out which police officers are gonna do horrifying, stupid things. Um, we worked with unemployment agencies to help them figure out who, who was going to be long-term unemployed. These were all examples of early warning systems and they had the same components over and over again. And so we were just doing the same type of system in different ways. Same for a lot of inspection systems that we've talked about. Um, you know, for example, the one that Jane and, and um, the other Brew brother was working on uh, um, with, uh, with EPA on identifying which facilities to inspect or which ho homes to inspect for safety or which uh, workplaces to inspect. So we were finding we're kind of doing these repeated problems and and so we built triage to make go from the tools we had access to off the shelf were things like scikit-learn and um, TensorFlow and, and all the other modeling tools, right? So there are tons of tools to build models. Um, takes two lines of code, given a matrix, you build a model and you're done, right? That's, that's the easy part. The hard part um, was really how do we go from um, how do we define the problem? We, we, what, what should be our role? Is the system being used to do weekly resource allocation decisions, which places to inspect? Is it monthly? How far out is the inspection being scheduled? What is the outcome we're predicting? Is it, is it who's going to graduate on time or who's not going to graduate or who might need, who needed a certain support program? All of those questions, you know, the reason we built sort of triage was to compensate for our laziness, basically. That's, that's why we build any tool, right? Because we, um, we're lazy, we cut corners, and, and, and we wanted to kind of not cut corners. We, uh, for example, when we do a machine learning project, um, uh, generating features takes a long time. We spend, and so sometimes we might not generate all the features we want to generate, like we'll come back to it. And sometimes we don't come back to it. Or we build a bunch, we, we take one outcome, one label and say, well, let's try this for now, then we'll come back and try others. And we sometimes don't come back and try others. Or we build a bunch of models and then we sort of, you know, say, okay, we, every project needs to have an audit for fairness and bias. Um, and most of the times it might happen, but sometimes you might say, oh, I think, you know, I'm just gonna check these little, some, some of these. And so what happens if we cut corners or we rediscover that something needs to be done. So the idea behind triage was, let's take commonly occurring problems that we, deal with when tackling data science problems in, in policy and social impact. Um, let's take the, the off the shelf scikit-learn, PyTorch, you know, um, TensorFlow type tools that exist to build models and put uh, an, a more end-to-end -end wrapper around it um, so that we focus, the people using it focus on the questions that are specific to the type of problems. Uh, what is your cohort? What is your outcome? How often are you generating how these decisions, how many resource, how much resources do you have to, 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 to intervene? What evaluation metric? Um, what is your, your fairness metric? What do you care about? Kind of that's, that's the configuration overall. And then from there, um, triage sort of guides you through each decision. It asks you these types of questions um, and tries a lot of different things um, and then gives you uh, sort of a structured way of, of making decisions around what models do I use? What's the impact of my models going stale? Uh, how often do I update them? Uh, how do I trade off if there is a trade off between fairness and interpretability and, and effectiveness and efficiency? Um, so it's really a tool that's, that's, that's uh, our attempt to standardize some of these, these steps um, and help people um, start from this before, you know, and so starting from scratch, 
and and build kind of these end-to-end -end tools that can that can go from problem formulation to uh, generating features to you know validation to building models to interpretation to bias audits um, and and maintenance. So that's kind of the the, the intention. Um, it's that it's it's open source. Uh, we have a few tutorials in there. Tristan's going to go deeper into more. Um, you know, what are the components? How do you use it? Um, but you know, we'd love for people to to try it out and 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 give us feedback. Thanks, Raid. So now up, we have Tristan, who Tristan was a software engineer at the Center for Data Science and Public Policy, and now he works at Gray Matter Analytics. Uh, Tristan, do you want to take it away? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Raid. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, so I worked at uh, the Center for Data Science and Public Policy for a few years as an engineer, and uh, yeah, it, uh, we built um, um, triage over the course of a few years, and, uh, you know, development is still going on. Um, I'm going to give uh, a presentation. Um, it's not like really a, it's not gonna be a complete um, uh, just for time reasons, but I'm gonna try and go through like the, uh, like the basics of how you model um, a data science problem in, in triage. So I'm basing this on a, um, uh, some slides that um, Kit Rodolfo also from Data Science and Public Policy put together a little while ago. I've made some some additions, um, but yeah, now I'll get started. Um, this is this slide is mostly duplicative with what uh, Raid was talking about. Um, I'm though I will add uh, like just some more like detail about the like what one thing that makes our uh, like data science for social good projects complicated uh, sometimes if you were to like do them from scratch is uh, what relates is things that relate to um, time. So like we would often do um, 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 temporal validation, which we'll talk about more later, but, um, but, but that affects, uh, but, but that affects a lot of uh, how you design your um, data science projects and it's really easy to screw up. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is to like kind of put that into a library that we could like just write once instead of like having data science, having data scientists write a million times with like slight variations. Um, so like, like, like that's one example that, uh, that made it useful for us to like focus on, on a, um, tool, uh, on like an end to end tool is to include, uh, some of the more complicated components like that, which are easy to screw up. Um, so yeah, we, uh, it's an end-to-end -end tool that includes, uh, like, as Raid said, like, initially, like, I'm designing, like, your, your, uh, what we call an experiment, uh, or, or a pipeline. Um, it has a few phases. Um, I'm only going to talk about the first one, which is kind of the, like, experimental phase, but we also have, like, uh, tools for model, for model selection and post modeling, um, as well as uh, like for bias and fairness, which like, uh, which we have more resources to um, look at as well. Um, so just a quick primer to when we say like, uh, um, temporal validation, um, there's a uh, uh, as opposed to, so if you're doing um, 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 data science, you may, you know, be familiar with um, um, cross-validation where, like, you split data into, like, equal chunks uh, to do um, training and testing, um, but uh, often that is, is, is randomized. Uh, but for temporal validation, we don't really randomize it. We do it by time with uh, the idea being um, you are, you're going to have to deploy this at a certain point in time. And, you're only, and when you deploy it, like in real life, you're only going to have access to data up to a certain amount of, um, up to a certain point in time. So we, it's useful for us to be able to model, to model our uh, uh, the performance, uh, like as if you were, say, in, the, in this example, in 2007. If you were to have deployed this model that you're building in 2007, how would it have done in 2008? And so forth. Um, uh, again, yeah, we'll get more into um, um, temporal validation later when we go into the time chop section, but that's the the uh, basic idea. Um, 
so uh, um, 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 triage is a very opinionated tool in that like it only works for certain types of problems. Um, and so like, so what you need to like both from a technical perspective and from a project perspective. So um, it's built like right now for um, like, like binary classification problems. So uh, what Raid mentioned about um, like early warning systems and inspection prioritization, those are like examples of uh, problem types which are generally binary classification problems. Like is like, uh, like what, you know, buildings or people are at risk of some, like of, of something. Um, and so, yeah, it's built around binary classification problems and um, uh, with um, temporal data. So that like events that happened in the, in the real world is, is like the, the primary data source. So for instance, it like, it's not built for like image recognition problems or, or um, 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 other things that fall under uh, machine learning, but don't really, uh, but don't really fit this, like this type of, of data set. Uh, from a technical perspective, um, it's, it, it's a Python tool um, and it uses um, Postgres as a, a um, database. It will run, on you know on any machine that uh, has those, um, we you know developed it on Linux, but we've ran it on Windows with some work. It'll run on laptops um, if the data is small enough to like really uh, to, to to really work on your laptop. But it, we would often deploy it at scale at at at, at DSAP uh, in like Amazon Web Services. Um, we uh, there are some things in like post modeling that uh, so I won't talk about, but there are some things that I'm um, use Jupiter, although the main like experiment interface is not Jupiter based. Um, just a quick uh, if you want to look at a detailed um, tutorial, uh, which I don't have time to go through here, but um, the um, dirty duck um, tutorial was our like it, the motivating example we're using. Uh, you know, named after a certain um, uh, a certain restaurant in Chicago that has some of the best food in the city, but also gets shut down by the health department a lot. Um, we we kind of guided our tutorial around the problem of prioritizing inspections. Um, so that's what 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 we're going to go through here. Um, where triage comes in in the in the um, in your um, pipeline is after so it basically assumes that you have data in a, a um, database in a Postgres database and uh, you and all of your data has this um, has um, um, attributes linked to events uh, with timestamps because it, it um, 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 treats everything as, as an event. Um, and what, if your data has that basic structure, um, you uh, run, well, essentially you write a configuration file, which is what the bulk of this presentation is going to uh, be about. You run your models uh, um, using triage, and then you use our model selection tool called um, audition to 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 um go to go through those results. Um, so this is um generally comes after you're like if you're working with a project partner, this would come like after your your ETL step and after you've and after you've done some basic data cleaning and um, um data and, and exploratory data analysis. So you so you have a good handle on what your data looks like. And so as a, so to to kind of make this example more concrete. Uh, going to this inspections problem where we're trying to prioritize uh, like restaurant inspections. Um, we have two, uh, we're going to kind of work with these um, two tables. Often uh, um, products using triage have a bunch of, of um, data sources, uh, but this is uh, kind of like the, the minimal example to see like the type of information that's useful to um, triage. So this, uh, we're going to call it the entities table. Uh, this would be basically be a list of your facilities that could be inspected, like uh, list of facilities that serve 
food in some way. Uh, um, so this could be restaurants, it could be grocery stores. There's some basic information in here. The idea is uh, there's an entity ID, which would be uh, a unique identifier. Um, that is one thing that um, is pretty, you know, is, is necessary to really run to um, run triage, uh, you, you know, any kind of, of data source that you're using needs to, uh, you know, needs to be relatable to the other data sources that, 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 that you're using. It doesn't do any um, deduplication. So if you're working with, uh, you know, a database where you don't have that, you can use other tools to um, deduplicate and get these uh, um, um, unique IDs. But for the, our purposes here, we're going to assume that like the, you know, the, uh, health inspector's office does have these unique uh, identifiers in their database. Um, they have some basic information about them, like what type of facility, and also these, uh, these date ranges, which are like activity, like, like whether or not their permits are active. So uh, the implication is that these ones without an end date are currently active, and these ones that have an end date were active at some point in the past. Uh, so that's like the basic um, on, um, entity date format. Uh, then the, the, the other table is our events table, which is really, it's recording our um, inspections. Uh, so these entity IDs refer back to the entities in the other table. We have a date of inspection, um, a, uh, a result of the inspection, and the like risk uh, um, related to, um, to, to that, like the risk level that the inspector found. In reality, in our in the default um, the full tutorial, we do have more data in here. We have like notes and stuff from the inspectors, but uh, for this example, we're just sticking with these columns. So these are like the two input tables that uh, we're going to use that that we're going to refer to in our um um, um triage configuration file. Uh, so before I go, so we're kind of at like the uh, stopping, like a a, a break point. I'm about to go into like the overview of the configuration. This is kind of the like a bulk of the presentation. But are are, are there any questions that uh, uh, I should answer uh, with like like what I've presented so far? I don't see any in the chat, Tristan. Okay. I think you've been very clear. I, I like that you're motivating uh, all the examples. It makes sense. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. I can move on then. So um, we, uh, we have like different components that uh, Raid mentioned uh, um, all, um, 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 all these, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through them in a little bit more detail. Uh, the cohort is uh, like the population that we want to model. And we'll talk about this more later. It has like all of these sections I go through in detail, but at the cohort is like, yeah, what entities I want to model. Uh, the temporal configuration is, uh, yeah, how I want to split data, um, how I want to split the data by time, how often I want to retrain models, uh, what time windows am I concerned with, uh, you know, failed inspections in. Um, the label uh, kind of works with those for saying like, what, yeah, what's my outcome? So um, in our case, it's like a, a failed inspection, but um, that, you know, the, the, the label is very different for, uh, for different types of projects what people spend most of their time in using triage projects is the feature aggregations and groupings. Uh, the, the system we use for uh, building features makes it easy to create a ton of them. Um, and, you know, if you're getting like, if you have like five data sources, six data sources, seven data sources, it takes, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of time just kind of like, you know, I'm designing features. Uh, then we have uh, some, uh, some some tools that do uh, like some parts of the pipeline that do mirror what like you might be used to in uh, libraries like SK Learn with uh, like uh, a modeling grid where you loop through a bunch of different models and hyperparameters uh, to on the same data, uh, as well as like computing evaluation metrics. Uh, so yeah, um, so 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 these are the main components. We do have more like um, uh, some more features that are more for power users, but aren't really like, you know, um, crucial to the understanding of like, like what a, a triage experiment is. I think um, one so thing- So I'm, I'm gonna, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm gonna focus on these ones. 
Well, I just wanted to add one thing is I was talking to Raid and he was talking through um, how uh, the configuration tells you everything you need to know about the technical modeling aspect about a project. It's like a, if you can read the configuration that the tri that triage, it's quite opinionated, but if you can read that, you know everything you need to know about the setup and framing of the problem. Yeah, it's, it's the way I describe it sometimes is, well, so one thing I noticed at, at DSAP is it made our, sometimes it made, so, you know, the, the structure of DSAP, uh, like the Center for Data Science and Public Policy, is we had like a bunch of products going on at one time. Like maybe we had a team of a dozen and we had like teams of like two or three people. So we would often have, you know, three or four triage products going on at one time. One thing that I don't know, like perhaps this was in Raid's mind when he was like coming up with the idea, but that I didn't really, you know, see coming until we were in all these meetings, is that it made it pretty easy for a team to present their project to the other teams yeah. so the other team could understand because um these these um decisions which are very important decisions like your cohort and your label how you're chopping time are very important and those are uh yeah like one, like once you're using the same framework it's um you know it can be easier to express the choices you made uh like you know using that framework um and it comes with some cost it uh for most people it's probably going to take longer using triage to like get their first model. Yeah. Like if you were like, oh, I just wanna like assemble some data really quick and you know, and run a random forest on it. You could probably do that faster just, just on your own if, 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 if you're used to tools like sklearn. But as you go, as, you, as the project comes more of like a production ready project, uh, you, the, the features you have to add to that pipeline get, you know, there, there's more and more friction to adding those. So this kind it of like- just It just doesn't it, scale. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, it just doesn't scale. Yeah. So th this is kind of like in triage, kind of like it forces you to think about more of these up front um, with the goal that like with the idea that like if you've done more of this up front, then you won't be scrambling to implement them, you know, a couple months into, into the project. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, try to be conscious of time. So actually, uh, so are we at a hard stop in nine minutes? Because I might have to speed this up more. Uh, Andrew, do you know if we're at a hard stop? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, like as, as close as we can to being done on time. Yeah. Okay. So I will go through. So we're going to post these slides. I'll go through, go through these a little bit. Um, I'm not, I think what I'm going to skip is the, um, the like explanation of like the, like the, like the details of what's of what's in the config. I think I'll just try to motivate these, well, like to kind of like talk about how we're we're doing these, like how we represent these um 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 um, um in our data, a little bit, um, uh, and hopefully that like, that's gonna like you know, uh, allow people to um do more reading, um, on our on our documentation later if they want. So uh, designing a cohort, yeah, this, these are the entities we include in modeling. Um, uh, so in this case, it's, we're talking what facilities we should consider for inspection. Um, active facilities are what we want. We don't wanna send inspectors to places that don't have permits anymore. Um, and it sounds like a basic thing, but it's also, you know, it's a, it's a real problem to um, deal with in data if you're prioritizing inspections. So that start date and end date I talked about before is, um, is is um, um key to that that like that's where we uh that's where we have that um in our data um so yeah we specify that with an sql query uh you'll see an as of date in brackets and this is actually i'm going to explain this on this next slide um this is probably like if i explain anything this is probably one of the most Im important things uh so i'm going to spend a little bit of time on this we call this an as of date in triage or um, we actually threw around a few names, but it's basically you're, it's like you're doing time travel. Uh, like what if instead of um, today being July 30th, it was January 1st, um, 2011. Uh, how would I model if this was that date? And so, yeah, we explained temporal validation a little bit before, but as of date is how um, um, triage uses this in modeling. So, um, uh, all of the, these database things like the features, the labels, and the cohort use what's called an as of date to uh, when, when, when triage crunches your time config, 
it uh, produces a bunch of dates that it wants to compute, it, it, that it wants to model data on. So if you're, if, you're inspec if you're inspecting once every few months, you're gonna have one of these as of dates once every few months and that you want to generate features, you want to generate outcomes based on that date. Um, so the idea is that you're, instead of having to reproduce this data for every date, you just, you, you give it a template. You give it a template that has this as of date and then your query is saying like at some particular point in time, uh, this is my, like, is the facility active? Uh, so yeah, I know I spent um, um, quite a bit of time on that. Uh, I'm not going to try and uh, make you into an expert on temporal validation right now. Uh, I did link to a deep dive, but essentially this is uh, how to instruct uh, triage how to do the time map that's important for your problem. Um, so there, it loops through a bunch of stuff. You can tell it like when to start making features, when to start making labels, how often to update what your label time spans are, which I will explain. Uh, how do you define your outcome? So uh, for this inspections problem, we're talking what facilities will fail inspection within a time frame. So like if you're scheduling for six months or two months, while well, you, you, well, you're, uh, and by scheduling, I mean scheduling inspectors, you're trying to, to generate an inspector, like uh, an inspector schedule for these, for the, for, for the six months. So you wanna know which facilities are going to fail inspection within the next six months. So uh, the label design is kind of, it starts off pretty similar to cohort design, but it includes concept of this label time span because uh, you might want to iterate over different label time spans. So like with this one label config, you can test, okay, I want um, to see, you know, inspections over one month or two months, uh, whether or not you're gonna have um, um, any failures. Uh, feature aggregations. Um, I probably don't have time to do this justice. Uh, what I do wanna say about um, Collate, which is what we uh, use in triage for generating, uh, um, for, for, for generating features, is that it's focused on generating large numbers of event um, 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 aggregations. So it's easy to do things like um, I want to generate SQL queries that uh, get the count of, of inspections over the last month, over the last three months, over the last six months. Um, you, can, you can give it a bunch of different quantities that, that you're trying to count, a bunch of different um, aggregation functions, a bunch of different time intervals. It'll combine all of those together. So like you can, with like a little bit of config, you can end up with, you know, a few dozen features like really quickly. Um, the same, we kind of look at categoricals, which are what we call like, okay, all the ones that are high risk, all the ones that are low risk, all the ones which are medium risk. Um, uh, there's like a section for that as well. Um, model algorithm. So this is more basic, uh, what people might be used to in like SK Learn. Uh, that's just like iterating through a bunch of different model algorithms and hyperparameters. It will, it will do that for you. And then I think the last thing that's kind of like is unique, not unique, but is like uh, important to triage that isn't necessarily important to a lot of um, um, data scientists is you're not often just looking for accuracy. You're looking for accuracy or like precision or recall on specifically like the facilities that you have the capacity to look at. So if I have the capacity to do 250 inspections on every quarter, do I care about accuracy for the whole list? I might not. I might care about how well these models are performing on those 250 highest facilities. Like if I send inspectors to these 250, how many of them are gonna be hits? How many of them are gonna be misses? How many of the real hits are not gonna be inspected? Uh, so we use that in our evaluation config where you can specify these um, thresholds you're saying, like I want the top performance on the top person, top five people, top 10 people, or on um, facilities. Um, so once you've done all that, you run triage, either as a Python package or um, command line, you get results in a database, like in your Postgres database, where you can look at your results. Um, you have some other features, like you can put your, 
um, like what your partner's doing currently, say if they're randomizing their inspection, you know, scheduling, you could put that as a model into your modeling grid. So you can use all of our tools for model selection again, so as you can see the lift over what the partner's doing. You can create some feature groups to answer the question, how crucial is like this data set to my model's performance? And as mentioned before, uh, the, the, the triage results uh, go right into the like next step tools of like audition and post modeling uh, for taking the next step. So um, you can next, you can look at our tutorial, the Dirty Duck um, tutorial. There's a quick start guide and we have some case studies of like real projects that were done and their, their triage can take. Um, you can also go to the um, repository, github.com slash gssg slash triage. Uh, if you want to, to, to see what's going on with, with the repo currently. Um, that's, yeah, that's all I have, uh, 1129. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beautifully Tristan. Done. <laughs> yeah, really bringing us in under the wire. Yeah, if, if anybody wants to go ahead and look at triage, it can, I think the, the framing that we did around this was that it can help you build America's next top model. Um, and, uh, and if you go and you look at the components, they're called things like audition and collate. And I think at one point post modeling was called Tyra. Yep. <laughs> so, so that's there. But thank you so much, Tristan, for attending today and presenting, giving us this tutorial. Uh, thank you, Ben Brew. Thank you to the participants from CPAL and also from AMFAN. Um, next week, as Jane mentioned, we'll be talking about bias and fairness and we'll have some really special guests in, in two weeks time. Um, and then, that's all for me. Andrew, do you want to close this out? Yeah, uh, so um, thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, thanks to all the panelists. Um, it looks like we still have a, a couple on. So thank you guys, Tristan, Ben, Ansel, um, and Tangi. Uh, and so like Harim said, next week is going to be on bias and fairness. And we would really appreciate it if any, everybody kind of spreads the word about these uh, about these webinars, you know, sharing over Twitter, retweeting the data science fellows, Twitter, um, and everything. We put a lot of effort into running these and we want as, as many attendees as possible. Um, so thanks everybody. And um, I guess we'll speak more in the solve for good Slack workspace. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.